Welcome to theater. We are starting at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Chapter 1. I have a picture of your textbook there. We're in the third edition. So if you're following along the page numbers, I am working with the third edition. Uh, my name is Professor Emily Seal here at Austin P. State University. I am an adjunct professor here, but I am located in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I work full-time for Motlow College. So um, you can see more information about me at emilybrownseal.com as well as in the intro. So I will not belabor the point of who I am because that will not be on your first of four tests. So um, as you remember, unit one is over chapter one, two, three, and four. But in this lecture, we'll just cover chapter one. Um, chapter one does an interesting thing. It starts kind of really big. And if you're a philosophical person, then this part of the chapter probably is right up your alley. If you like to ask big questions or think big, then this is kind of where it starts. Not only what is theater, but what is art? Um, and uh, what makes it art? Uh, for a lot of you, maybe the first thing you think of is just like, the art museum. If somebody said you're going to take an art class. If I'm advising a student in my office, they say art like in a museum art, like pictures art, and that's probably what a lot of you think of. Um, but your book kind of goes a step further in defining it as kind of a skill. We're on page five right now. Something that takes mechanical ability to do. So if you see a painting with all of these fascinating little brush strokes and you step back and you say, oh, I could never do that, then that's art. Um, the same is true if you watch a ballerina and she can lift her foot above her head, then you'd say, ooh, that is art. That is skill, mad skills, art. Um, then that's one way, just mechanically, the ability or skill is one way to define art. Um, Mona Lisa there. My favorite definition of art is a song lyric. It says, art is why I get up in the morning, but my definition ends there. And I think for a lot of us artists, people who art is kind of our life, or, you know, we're dedicated to the arts. It's kind of can be a love-hate relationship, something that we, um, live to create. We have this passion, this need to create things, whether it's poetry or music or, um, you know, when David Sedaris talks about his sister, how, you know, he'll come and she says she's not an artist, but she'll be working on a mosaic or she'll be building a chair because art, artistry just kind of leaks out of her. She has to create. And for those people who have that sort of bug to make things, um, they kind of know that it's just what they do. And, and it's, Andy Warhol also famously kind of said, you know, other people sit around and talk about what is art or ask, is this art good or is this bad? But you just keep making art and let them waste their time sitting back and kind of speculating what is art. Um, but for a lot of us, it is a lifestyle. It's something that we do every day. It's why we get up in the morning. It's what keeps us going. It what inspires us is that creativity. And um, I'm talking about, of course, all kinds of art forms. Um, some of you, cooking is your art. For some of you, um, writing songs. For some of you, it's drawing. For some of you, it's theater. And so um, for me, um, I'm an actress, and I'm also a um, stitcher. I do uh, design costumes and things. Um, but I'm definitely always into different kinds of creative ways. I like to write, I like to cook, um, but creativity is just kind of a lifestyle for me. And, um, but it, Ani DeFranco goes on in this song to say, it seems like it's not fair. I'm living for something I can't even define. And uh, there you are right there in the meantime. And then she goes on to say, I don't want to play for you anymore. And sometimes we as artists, when we get too deep into the thick of it, uh, it can be sort of an existential crisis of am I here to please my audience? Am I here for me? Uh, you know, who am I making this for? So it can be sort of a love-hate relationship with art. Um, one of my other favorite definitions of art, as said by Pablo Picasso here, the purpose of art is washing the dust off of daily life off of our souls. 
The thing that I like about that is thinking of art as soul food. Not only do I like to create art, um, but I like to be surrounded by beauty. A lot of you will go to a lot of trouble to decorate your office or to decorate your house or to put on cool clothes when you wake up in the morning as a way of self-expression and as a way of surrounding yourself with things that make you happy. Um, Beauty on a deep level is something that satisfies us. I recently traveled to Scotland um, to teach speech. I also teach speech and uh, you know, walking through the mountains in Scotland and seeing these castles, um, it really satisfied me on a deep level to be surrounded by that kind of natural beauty in the mountains and the flowers. And it was in July, so everything, I mean, it was in June, sorry, uh, everything was in bloom, the flowers were out, and uh, just beauty touches me on a deep level. And uh, some of you find different things beautiful. That's kind of a cool thing about art, too, is that what's beautiful to you may not be beautiful to me. You know, some of you uh, may be into horror or uh, metal music, you know, and that's maybe not what reaches me, but it's beautiful to you. So, whereas I can sit and listen to some folksy music and really find beauty in that, um, we each have things that kind of feed us and give us um, meaning and enjoyment. Um, Another famous example of this is that they did theater in concentration camps. And you may ask yourself, you know, why amongst all that pain would you bother to do a play? And I think it was a form of escapism. It was a way to celebrate the beauty of life amidst the ugliness. Um, And the last kind of thing that art is, is art is meaning. Aristotle says the aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. Um, So we watch a story or we see a picture and it points to a greater philosophical truth. Um, You know, we watch, (laughs) this might be a bad example, we watch Cinderella and true love conquers all and we walk away from that and we say, yeah, true love does conquer all. And, um, you know, I find truth in that. I love my husband. Uh, He uh, brings a lot of purpose and meaning to my life. So when I see that reflected in a Prince Charming, well, of course, my husband isn't, you know, the Prince Charming, but in a way that echoes truth to me on a deep level when we see it acted out. Um, Now we'll get into Aristotle in our fourth chapter later on in this unit, Um, but he was a scientist and he wanted to categorize things. He made a big deal of going through animal kingdom and going through plants and trying to decide how they should be categorized. And he takes that same kind of scientific method to plays. He says, hey, if we watch this play, we can find the truth in it and observe ourselves and then extract a sort of philosophy from watching it. You know, have you ever seen something or listen to a song. This is one of the best examples is breakup songs, right? And you feel like, how did they know what I was thinking when they wrote this song? It's exactly how I'm feeling. That is a way of putting it into words and giving the art gives meaning to uh, my particular situation. Um, Another aspect of um, Aristotle, if you're turning over to page 8 here, You can see that Aristotle was a student of Plato. Uh, Surely, if you're on college level, you've heard these names before. Um, But Plato thought that theater was vice and wickedness. Now, I know you're going to kind of be surprised to hear me say this, but there is a bit of truth in what Plato is saying. The theater has always been a kind of place of debauchery, (laughs) or almost always, I should say. This picture right here is... um, from the Roman times. And in the Roman times, um, there was a popular expression said by a political figure. He said, Panem et circensis. And you may have heard that uh, Panem term in the Hunger Games. It means bread and circus. We can keep our people satisfied if we just give them bread and circus. And if you're in it just to tune out, if you're in it just to relax and zone out, and hey, I do it too. I sit down and watch TV at the end of the day to just kind of forget my problems. But if that becomes a lifestyle, 
where you're just trying to tune out and forget the world, then that can um, lead to a sense of indulgence and uh, vice and wickedness. Even, you know, a lot of people think Shakespeare, he's like this, you know, classical proper person well actually Shakespeare's Theatre of the Globe was on the other side of the river from London because it was where the prostitutes were it was where the bear baiting was popular I don't know if you're familiar with this they would tie a bear to a stake and then sick the wolves on them and watch the bear fight the wolves uh, you know just this grotesque kind of sense of escapism you know anything to forget about and kind of um, uh, separate yourself from your everyday life. Um, but Plato felt like it was a way um, to kind of persuade lots of people at once, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this chapter. It was something that could be used to sort of um, trick people. Uh, smoke and mirrors, you know. Uh, and we'll, like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, Theater can be dangerous, and it's there's a certain power in theater or art that you have to be aware of. You know, um, if I were to think, ha ha, let me make this video and put it on YouTube about how to make a bomb, uh, you know, then somebody goes and makes a bomb, well, there's, there's power in that, and there's a certain amount of responsibility. So we'll kind of talk about towing that line between... Um, using art and using theater as something that is edifying and then abusing art or abusing theater later in this. Okay, so we kind of talked about what is art. That's my nephew right there on the left. His name is Samson. and The one who's Captain America in this picture. <laughs> um, but we talked about what is art and now we're kind of moving on to what is theater. Um, we're on page nine here at the bottom. Um, so all of the arts kind of can have several different topics. We can talk about uh, art is a picture, we can just draw some fruit, but theater is always going to be human-centric because humans are the ones who perform it. So, and I'd like to argue that theater is something instinctual. It's something that all humans do, right? And some of you are like, no, -uh, I would never get up in front of people. I would never perform. I've never even done a choir concert. I'm not a performer. Well, theater is something imaginary. Anytime we do something for an audience, if I were to tell you a story, if I was to ask one of you to stand up right now and just tell me a story with a beginning, middle, and an end about the time you wrecked your car, well, that is, in a sense, performing. That is, that speech, that little speech that you gave, the anecdote, is a performance. And it's something that you instinctively do. And say you're telling me the story about how you wreck the car. And then when the girl gets out of the car to come towards you, um, she says, uh, oh, how dare you hit my car? I know you weren't paying attention. I saw you trying to put on your mascara. And I do that kind of moment where I act out the way that she said it. Um, then I'm taking theater even to another level. And when my nephew um, pretends to be Captain America or his friend there throws the Thor hammer at him, they're kind of engaging in a game of pretend that is very instinctual for us. And we look at the history of theater, people kind of um, around campfires telling stories of the hunt. You know, that's not something that anybody had to teach them to do. It was something very instinctual. So it's very human. It's something that we do by nature. And it's something that I think will always happen. You know, some people say, is theater really dead? I really don't think it ever will be because it's something that is exciting and something that we do instinctually. Um, moving on to page 10. Theater is something that is emotional. An art is something that is emotional. It's going to create a response. You think about the last good movie that you saw or that you recommended to a friend. Um, you know, you might say to your friend, oh my goodness, I laughed so hard. You've got to go see that movie. Um, and for some of us, no, I know not everybody, but for some of us, you're like, oh, it made me cry. You know, if it touched me on that deep level, then it's worth going to see that movie. Um, as it is about humans, it's always going to have uh, some way of making you feel, maybe because you have a light bulb moment and you understand something in a new way, um, or maybe 
sometimes things are just emotional in their beauty, but um, theater and art, especially theater, is always going to have an emotional element. As you know, the ancient Grecians, they would go to the theater in order to have these big emotional cathartic moments where they would cry and kind of purge themselves and their souls with their tears, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, so moving on to page 11, or the bottom of page 10, really. Um, it's a way theater is, and this is a famous Hamlet speech. It's his advice to the players. And Hamlet tells his actors to be natural, to act naturally, and to hold, as it were, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time is form and pressure. So... He's saying that the purpose of art, but particularly acting, is to show people themselves. To show the time or the culture kind of what they look like. And um, we do that in a very ordered and structured way. So if, um, if we were just doing a play-by-play. -play. Say I set up a video camera for some reason in my living room and you got to watch me all day just preparing this lecture. Play-by-play -play, like security camera. Right? That, some people would argue, is not art. <laughs> Myself included. Art is when you would take that and form it in a way that it makes sense and it has meaning. All those things we were talking about earlier. There's beauty. We've got a cinematographer involved. And we hold that visage, we hold that image up to people and help them create value statements based on who they are um, and what we're showing them about themselves. So um, you can see here the sociologist quote, uh, to create order out of chaos, to organize things. Um, and the mirror image is one that's very widely used in talking about theater. Brecht said that theater was not a mirror to hold up to nature, but a hammer with which to smash it. <laughs> um, you know, that, but it's a common thing that we all see uh, that in some way, even something as fantastical as Alice in Wonderland, you know, how is this a reflection of the times when a little bunny rabbit is wearing a frock coat and carrying a stopwatch? Well, that is still a reflection of the human need to get somewhere on time and oh I'm late I'm late especially in the industrial age when um, time had a whole new importance so this mirror image is one that we really want to go back to over and over again in this class that part of the purpose of art is to show us ourselves take a good look in the mirror now I know some of you look at this picture and it's just offensive and I would tend to agree um, this is Jim Crow. Um, some of you may know the Jim Crow laws. Um, Jim Crow is actually a character created by a white man who would put on blackface. Now some of you think of Jim Crow. He wasn't a governor. He wasn't. He was actually a character that this white fa this white man, when he put his face on black, would dance around and do a silly jig and jump Jim Crow. And I think it's interesting that our um, textbook goes into this long uh, check, of, uh, check example of a playwright in Africa, but we have examples here in the U.S. as well about theater being used for political platform. Obviously, the character of Jim Crow was so popular that they named a law after him. Um, this was performed in the vaudeville circuits. Once again, a white man in blackface jumping around doing an impression that's very offensive of African American people. Which begs the question, how was it used as propaganda? This isn't something, of course, that, that Americans exclusively have done, but when they show this image of a black man as a buffoon and as a bumbling idiot and as someone who just yasa no sir and jumps around, even up until the 1940s when we had that on television, it created an image in people's minds of what the black man was that had to be busted out of that stereotype by actually meeting a black man and seeing that that wasn't the way that they operated. Um, but this propaganda is immensely powerful. Just going back to what we said earlier, there's a responsibility in that, in knowing that when you create a black man on 
the screen or stage are you perpetuating stereotypes. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this, um, one of my favorite playwrights is August Wilson, but um, there's a movie by Spike Lee called Bamboozled, which is a really interesting kind of history of the black man. Um, well, it's not a documentary style, but it, it goes back a lot to how he's been represented in America. Um, but that that propaganda has led to laws, so it's something to think about. It's powerful, even if it's just vaudeville played in bars. The other question that comes around, too, is censorship. Should I be allowed to put up a picture of Jim Crow in my office? And should I be allowed to put blackface on in Halloween and dance around and make fun of black men? Personally, I think that censorship in that case is right. Some of you may have heard Song of the South, um, which is a Disney movie um, about Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox. And there's a older black, black gentleman who um, is one of those happy-go-lucky slave archetypes who says, there's a bluebird on my shoulder. It's the truth. It's actual. Um, and Disney, of course, has censored that since. He, they have pulled all of Song of the South off the shelves and um, no longer sell it in stores. Once again, I think correctly so, but you have to know that art is something theater that has always been used for good and for bad and has always been mostly regulated by the government um, and people in power. You know, when Shakespeare came out in his time, the queen would dictate, you can do this or you can't do this. She had an official person who would watch the play and regulate. Um, of course, we'll study in theater history that the church shut down theater as it used to be performed to these Grecian and Roman gods when Christianity came into popularity and power they shut down the theater altogether and there wasn't theater for about a thousand years so once again it's a weapon and it can be used for good or bad. Um, so kind of going back to the roots of theater its original word um, we academics call this etymology what was the first way that this was described and the theater comes from the word theatron which means the seeing place so if you went to one of these big ancient grecian theaters you can see thousands of people football theater style uh, football stadium style and then that was called a theatron or a seeing place but another word that we use interchangeably is the word drama and drama has a Greek word root which is dran which is to do or to be active and this is kind of one of the coolest things about theater is that it is ethereal it is something that happens and then it is no more it is a living art form uh, it's live so if you go to see a play on Wednesday night then the actor may say to be or not to be that is a question Right, and then you go on Friday night and the actor says to be or not to be, that is the question. Depending on their mood, depending on whether the light guy decided to flicker the lights and kind of mess it up a little bit in one moment, uh, you know, uh, there's always going to be a human and at fault for human error, right, which we'll get into that next chapter when we talk about the differences between film and theater. But drama is something live. It is something that happens in the moment. Another thing that um, drama is, is conflict. It's always going to have a sense of something has gone wrong and we are trying to work it out. It maybe a humorous thing I just slipped on a banana peel or it could be a horrible thing I slipped on a banana peel and now I'm in a coma <laughs> you know um, but it's always going to revolve around conflict and you're gonna hear me say that over and over again in this class there's a conflict happening what is the conflict look for the conflict um, you know as you get into writing your monologue I'm gonna ask you have you found enough conflict in the story to create a meaningful um, movement but so Dran theater is live it's something that happens in the moment it is a happening as it were it's something that is never going to be the, exactly the same from one moment to the next uh, it's here and then it's gone uh, theater is always going to be about humans so whereas a play um, whereas like a portrait can be of an apple or a pear 
uh, in theater, a human being has still got to portray an apple or a flower. And so it's always going to be from a human perspective. And it's interesting, um, Peter Brook says in The Empty Space that really all we need for theater is human beings. All we need is empty space and human beings. It was kind of cool. Um, I got to see, this is Second City. They're a touring company, but they're also... I saw the touring company, but they're based in Chicago. They're an improv group. You may see some faces there that you recognize. Tina Fey is one of my favorite Second City alums. But they would go into a theater with nothing but just themselves, and they would make up stories and act them out. And instead of actually having, for example, a pencil on stage for a prop, they would just pantomime having a pencil. And it's really kind of cool to see that you can entertain people just with your body and um, using your self as an instrument and a way to relate to other people. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, theater is a collaborative art form. So this is another one of my pl favorite plays or theater experiences that I've had, which is Wicked. Um, Wicked is a play about the Wizard of Oz before uh, Dorothy shows up in Oz. It's about the relationship between Glinda and Elphaba, Elphaba being the Wicked Witch of the West. And so in this picture, you get the depiction of Oz, which may be similar to what you've seen in the Wizard of Oz with uh, lots of fantastic colors and interesting shapes, something not traditional. But you can think, just in this one picture, how many artists are involved? So we've got the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine actors, right, who are standing up there. Now we had to have a costume designer who made all those costumes and decided to put a zipper at the bottom of her dress or make the hat that shape. And then we had the prop designer, the person who made this beautiful signboard that he's wearing, Wizomania the Musical right um, and put probably the prop guy made those tickets that are in their hands and then we had a set designer who created that crate that looks like a um, metal clock that's hanging behind them and then we had a lighting designer who decided to um, light that s that scrim back behind them different shades of green and orange right he decided to put that little flick of orange just for some contrast against the green you can think about how many artists not including the choreographer who decided to position these actors in this way to tell a certain story. It's very theatrical, it's very uh, celebratory, right? Every single artistic decision is combined to create one story, which is um, amazing to think about what a feat of human will it is to get all of these people on the same stage to tell the same story. So. Um, it is a collaborative and it is artistic. And even though um, those are two extremely different kinds of art, Second City where they're touring around and they just come and stand on the stage by themselves, and Wicked where it's full costumes, full set, full makeup, full wigs, um, those are both theater. And uh, it's an artistic choice for the Second City to wear nothing but black, right? Or to wear a suit. But... Um, so theater is collaborative art form. Okay, now we're getting into um, page 17. And these are different categories of theater. Uh, if you were to walk up to me and say, oh, I saw a play last month, and I were to ask you, what play was it? And you might say, a Noel Coward play. And I would say, which one? And you'd say, Fallen Angels. And I might say, oh, well, I've never seen that one. There are so many kinds of plays. Uh, I guarantee you that I have not seen even a drop in the bucket of the plays that are out there. Um, so we're starting to kind of categorize in a way that is helpful. So if you say to me, I want to see a play for my um, production, uh, I'm going to New York, and I'm going to go see a big Broadway play. And I'd say, okay, that is commercial theater. Commercial is entertainment, it's lighthearted, it's safe, it's something we can enjoy. This is a production of me when I was in undergrad um, portraying a Noel Coward character. She is funny, Noel Coward is lighthearted, he's witty, uh, but he's not going to exactly make you ask deep life questions. You know, this is a fun romance here. Uh, you can see pretty costumes, silly banter, uh, 
I'm not exactly going to change my mind about deep-seated issues. So that's kind of the definition of commercial theater. Most of what we see in Broadway and community theater is commercial. So this is uh, The Game of Love and Chance by Marivaux. This is a French play uh, that we performed, like as you can see in the traditional um, kind of Louis XIV time. You can see the wig that he has on there and the ribbons on his shoes. Uh, you can see there that I'm wearing big, heavy, that dress was so heavy, but it was exactly as the people would have worn. And the expressions that are in it were kind of archaic. In fact, uh, you know, the names took a while for me to learn how to pronounce them because uh, even saying the author's name, Marivaux, you know, that's not a word that I would usually say. So these would be considered a historical play. It's a way of us to teach history by representing a play. Now, uh, this is any play can fit into multiple categories. This was a lighthearted romance. So once again, this is a little bit commercial, but it's also a little bit historical. Whereas the Noel Coward piece is set in the 1930s. It's a little bit historical. It's also a little bit commercial. So any given thing can fit into more than one category, of course. So political theater. Um, you can see the men who are representing soldiers here and you may or may not see the swastikas on their armbands. Um, another kind of subtlety which you may not catch is that the entire stage is a swastika. Uh, no, I was not doing a political propaganda piece, uh, not supporting uh, Hitler here, uh, but it was a political play. The themes of the play were meant to incite or bring about um, disenfranchised people and we tell the stories of World War II and and these great wars to kind of retell our current stories. Um, and so this was actually Die Rätsel. It was a play about um, what is evil, basically. Uh, and so it was in no way glamorizing the political things. But uh, when we tell these stories, they can be exciting or excite audiences. It's not uncommon if we look before the turn of the century for plays to have incited mobs of people throwing things. That people would go out of the theater and they'd be so angry um, that they would burn carriages and attack people in the streets. And we have modern day examples of that. Some people say that when um, a Spike Lee movie you know, came out, they they went out and rioted in the street. But in, in theater, it was much more immediate because of the mob mentality that went into it. Some plays that were um, protested, you can uh, look into were uh, Playboy of the Modern World, which was an Irish play. And as we all know, the tumultuous relationship that Ireland and England had in the turn of the century. Um, some other political plays are uh, Brecht, who I said, Bertolt Brecht, who was right after World War II, play, themes of communism that came through, very controversial. Um, so uh, another kind of play within the political is experimental. This is Kafka's Metamorphosis. You can see there that there's a guy back there uh, representing the bug, and I'm presenting his mother. A lot of the lines didn't make sense. A lot of the way that we interacted with each other was not, was more dreamlike. Um, and obviously he doesn't have on a bug costume with, uh, you know, a head antenna. He's just wearing all black and that's meant to represent sort of uh, part of this experimental or outlandish style. Um, a lot of experimental plays mean to kind of reinvent the conventions of theater, kind of reimagine what theater can be. Um, so yeah, some famous uh, experimental plays are Marat Saad, uh, which is a Peter Weiss play, in a lot of 1960s and 1970s. A lot of the plays that come out of that era are meant to sort of challenge what it is we're doing. Another experimental play I've been in would be Hair. You know, um, all of the, there was not in the production that I did, but a lot of the productions had people smoking pot right there on stage. And the movement was not jazz hands or tap shoes, which is what we had seen in musical theater before. It was much more organic, much more flowy. Uh, people weren't in costumes. They were meaning to reimagine what it is that theater could be. Last kind of, uh, adjective we can use to describe theater here is cultural. Um, here I'm playing a cowgirl. 
uh, yeah, co- cowboy, the rodeo, it's gone to hell in a handbasket. And that was kind of the voice that I get got to use the entire time. It celebrated the westerns and uh, John Wayne and all of that. It was written by a Kentucky artist. Um, and it's can sometimes be a way for us to stand around and rally around a culture that we celebrate. Um, obviously, an extreme form of that is Japanese kabuki plays with, um, you know, traditional face painting and puppetry and um, larger than life acrobatics. Um, Closer to home, you know, Tyler Perry plays would be an expression of the African American culture. Uh, Very much about celebrating a group of people and the culture that they have. And so once again, this this play is entertaining. It's not just a cultural play. I don't mean to kind of put it under the microscope and make it something less than what it is, but uh, a big part of what it is is to celebrate culture. Perhaps the best play for me, uh, which was also turned into a movie, was Steel Magnolias. When I saw my culture kind of being acted out, a southern culture, albeit not Louisiana, I'm a Tennessee girl, but when I saw, you know, a southerner acted out as something besides sort of a hillbilly redneck, I was like, yeah, that's that's what I see. I see women uh, gossiping in a barbershop, you know, that's the kind of culture that I grew up in. So theater can very much be a celebration of culture. Um, Moving on to page 19, we're talking about what is art and what is entertainment. Now, once again, I want to reiterate, I love entertainment. I love um, 1940s tap dancing, Gene Kelly, um, Fred Astaire, smile, jazz hands, Um, but you just need to know that there is a difference between the two things. And the kind of best way that sometimes you can think of it is art is Oscar bait. A lot of the movies that are going to get Oscars are going to be about uh, slavery or uh, prostitution, really heavy, thoughtful things that challenge us and make us think. Um, And then, of course, the entertainment pieces are not likely to get an Oscar. So, and this, once again, is a continuum. Things can be halfway between entertaining and artistic. And just because something thinks t- makes you think doesn't mean it doesn't make you laugh. In fact, I would argue a lot of the farces of our time, a lot of the Mel Brooks movies, a lot of the Saturday Night Live sketches, or Stephen Colbert, the funniest things are the meanest cultural reflections that are challenging our presuppositions. So... Art tends to be a self-expression. It's when an artist sits down and says, this is coming out of me. This is my story. This is what I was born to tell. Whereas in sitcom world, we tend to get down five or ten people in a room and we have a screening and we ask them, okay, what didn't you like? Okay, we'll cut that scene. It's more about appealing to a public interest rather than telling the story of your soul. Art tends to challenge the status quo. So once again, when Stephen Colbert makes fun of a politician for his behavior, he is challenging kind of how things were previously done. Whereas entertainment, you know, if you turn on a sitcom like Friends or something fun like that, it's Gossip Girl, it's not likely to make you really think too much. It's not going to make you challenge what you believe on a deep level or have any gravitas to it, right? It... um. In art, you have to actively watch, you have to think, you have to be engaged, you have to say, um, wait, that's not right. Whereas, once again, in entertainment, couch potato time, time to zone out and smile and nod along. Art tends to make you challenge or redefine yourself and your culture. You know, who are we that this is how we are depicted on stage or how we think of ourselves, whereas entertainment is never going to lead you down the path of self-reflection or criticism. It's always going to keep you smiling and laughing. Um, you know, if you go to the circus, not likely to have a existential moment, right? Art tends to make you think. It tends to incite reflection or thoughtfulness or quietness, whereas entertainment is just going to let you run away, right? Just going to let you run away. All right, so just to kind of wrap up, I really love about this book on page 22 and 23 that they give you kind of a concise 
quick overview of everything that we've talked about. Um, but uh, hopefully today that you've gotten out of that we're talking about art on a philosophical level. We've got some great quotes there. Make sure before the quiz that you look at particularly um, the mirror metaphor, what art is, a skill, beauty, and meeting, um, who Aristotle was, what Panem, the bread and circus is, um, what are the different forms of art, what is Theatron, what is Dran, uh, and what is a play in general supposed to do if it has a entertainment value versus an artistic value. What do they want you to do? So make sure you look at all of those things as you move into the next three lectures before you take that quiz. Um, all right, I hope you have enjoyed lecture number one. Thank you for listening.